No, pa, I'll give you that. Uh, you're very welcome to Glen Warrior this morning. If you're visiting with us and you don't know who I am, my name is Trevor and I'm the minister here. As you come in this morning, you should have got a little white notice sheet that highlights everything that's coming up in the week ahead. But please allow me just to draw your attention to a few things. There will be a choir practice after church this morning and then after the midweek on Wednesday evening. Uh, if you can, uh, please come along to that. We meet for worship this evening at 7 p.m., continuing our study in the book of Acts. There should be, in our pattern, there would be tea after the service today because it's the last Sunday in the month, but we're going to uh, postpone that to next week so that we can use the, the, the goodies that are prepared for the Friday Friendship Club uh, for the tea after the service as well next Sunday. Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock is our midweek meeting, and that will be an all-together meeting continuing our studies in First Samuel. We are looking forward to our harvest services, which will be two weeks today. Uh, and as usual, there will be an opportunity to donate uh, any produce that you have for harvest. What date was that, Andrew? You give it to me, but I've forgotten. Seventh. So that will be the 7th of October, uh, just an advance notice of that. Saturday, the 7th of October, the church will be open to receive donations of our harvest produce. Well, I trust that these are all the announcements in the will of the Lord. We're thinking this morning together about John chapter 13, second half of the chapter. And we remind ourselves then of these great words as we come to worship God from 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. Paul writing to the church in Corinth reminds them of this. That it was for our sake he made him, that is Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the great exchange that takes place at the cross of Christ. That our sin, our unrighteousness, our unworthiness is laid on Christ, and Christ's righteousness, Christ's perfect obedience becomes ours. We come this morning to worship God. I invite you to stand, if you're able, as we join our hearts together, singing the wonderful words of this hymn, Come, people of the risen King, who delight to bring him praise. We'll stand, if we're able as we sing.
Well, friends, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather together this morning, we give you thanks indeed that we can come as people who rejoice, as people whose hearts are uplifted. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that whatever our personal circumstances might be at the moment, we can rejoice in the hope of sins forgiven. We can rejoice in the hope of Christ this morning. We thank you, Father, that that hope causes us to, 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 to lift our eyes beyond the shadows of this earth, to lift our eyes beyond what is fleeting in this earth, and to lift our eyes to the ultimate reality of eternal life with Christ. And when we consider that this morning, Father, our hearts truly rejoice. When we consider what Paul has recorded for us here in this letter to the church in Corinth, that great exchange that took place at the cross of Christ. We thank you this morning that all of our guilt, all of our unworthiness, all of our sin was laid on Christ. That that was what it meant for him to be the sin-bearing substitute. That it was bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place condemned he stood. So that in him we might be the righteousness of God. So that in Christ this morning through faith we might know his obedience credited as ours. We might know his perfection credited as ours. When we consider that this morning, Heavenly Father, truly we have cause to rejoice. Truly we have cause to be thankful. But we also recognize this morning, Father, that there are those who have gathered in with us who are weeping through the night. That there are those who have gathered in with us whose hearts are heavy through illness, whose hearts are heavy through the, the, the things that they have to bear in this life. And we want to pray this morning that they might be uplifted, that they might be comforted from you and from your word. We thank you, Father, for that great assurance we have that whenever we cry to you, you hear us. Whenever we call to you, you answer us. And as we come this morning, Father, we thank you for the great privilege that it is to gather together as your people, to come and to worship the risen Christ. We thank you that we are people of the risen King, that we gather together this morning not to, to commemorate a dead Savior, but to praise a risen one. Not to mourn that our Savior is still in a tomb, but we come this morning rejoicing that our Savior is seated at your right hand in glory, and from there intercedes for us. We thank you, Father, for the privilege it is to come into your presence this morning. The people such as we, sinners as we are by birth, sinners as we are by nature, those who are opposed to you and opposed to your law, are welcomed before your throne of grace. We thank you, Father, for the privilege that it is to worship you. To join together with our brothers and sisters to sing your praise, to bring our prayers before you, and to sit under your word. And we pray, Father, that you would bless us now. Bless us as we come together. Bless us as we hear your word. Bless us as we sing your praise. And may you encourage our souls and strengthen our walk with you, we ask. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we are continuing this morning our studies in John's Gospel. If you have a Bible with you, have it open in front of you, please. John's Gospel. If you don't have one with you, there should be a, a, a Bible in the pew in front of you somewhere. And we're going to read from John's Gospel, chapter 13, and then verses 21 down to the end of the chapter, verses 21 down to verse 38. John chapter 13, I'm beginning to read at verse 21. This is the word of God. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, 
Who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Amen. This is the reading of God's inspired and inerrant word, and we trust that God will bless the reading of his word to our souls. Well, boys and girls, if you want to come down to the front, uh, I'll come down and meet you in a wee minute or two. How are we all this morning? Good. Right, I think we're going to need two rows this morning again. Good job. Good job. Now, I've brought my bag along this week again, and I've brought some things to show you, okay? And you have to try and work out what the connection is between all of the things that I have brought, okay? Everyone understand the game? Yes? Okay, let's see. So the first thing, the first thing that I have brought is this. What is this? A picture. A picture of who? Me and Mummy. When was that picture taken? No clue. It was taken a very, very long time ago. I would say, yeah, before any of you were born. So this picture is older than any of you. We'll leave that there. Maybe leave it there for the whole service. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Mummy might not approve of that. So, the picture of me and Mummy. There's a picture then. Not a picture. What's this? A newspaper. A newspaper. Okay. So, we've got a picture and we've got a newspaper. No, you can't read the newspaper. Can anyone figure out the connection? What's the connection between a paper and a picture? Alfie? New news, as opposed to old news. What would new news be? New news. I I feel that we're going around in circles here. George, what's the answer? The newspaper was about Jarbone. Okay, do you want some more clues? See if we can work it out. So we've got a picture, we've got a newspaper, and... We've got a packet of crisps. <laughs> Cheese and onion crisps. Cheese and onion crisps. Alfie, you want another go? No. no. Anyone figure out the connection? No. Noah. They all have photos on them? Okay. A packet of crisps doesn't have a photo on it. Where? I'm not sure that's a photo. Okay, well, no, it's not the right answer anyway. Alfie. Having my lunch on a picnic bench? How does the photo get into that, though? Yeah? Right, there's one final clue. We'll have to see if you can get it from this one. A cricket ball. Okay. So we've got a cricket ball. We've got, it's pretty hard. 
I'm not giving it to you because I know, I know how that ends. We've got a cricket ball. We've got a packet of crisps. We've got a newspaper. And we've got a photograph. No. Eli. Sports, not quite. Anyone work it out? If you look at the photograph, there might be little clues on the photograph. Yes. A wedding anniversary. You're getting closer. You're getting closer. <laughs> Judah. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> you need to breathe a little bit. Right, Noah, can you? <laughs> Things I love. That is the right answer. Cricket, crisps, newspapers. And uh, Suzanne, that'll get me extra brownie points at home later, hopefully. So they're all things that I love. Now, why am I telling you that this morning? If we listen to our Bible reading, can we think why we might be telling you that this morning? Because what did Jesus tell us to do in the Bible reading? Hmm? Anyone listening? What did Jesus tell us to do? To lo- lo- love, one to love one another. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's talking to his friends. And he says to them, look, this is how people are going to know you're my followers. This is people, how people are going to know that you're my friends if you love one another. And you know, boys and girls, that's quite a challenge for us, isn't it? Because sometimes people annoy us. Sometimes people upset us. Sometimes people might even do bad things to us or wrong things to us. But if they trust in Jesus as their savior, Jesus tells us that we have to love them because this is how people will know that we're his disciples if we love one another. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for the love that he has for us. We thank you for this challenge he gives us to love one another. We pray that you would help us to love one another well. Help us to look out for one another at school. Help us to be friends with one another at school. And help us, Father, to love everyone who loves Jesus. We thank you for the boys and girls. We thank you for the joy that they bring to us as a congregation. And we pray that you out to Faith Connection. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. You can go back to your seats. Uh, Just before the boys and girls head out to Faith Connection, we're going to stand together and sing again. Uh, This time, happiness is the Lord. Happiness is to know the Savior living a life within his favor, having a change in my Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me, in close relation, having a part in his salvation, happiness is the Lord, real joy is mine, no matter if the teardrops start, I find the secret. normally head out to Faith Connection, you can head out now. Thank you.
And we'll continue in our worship this morning as our morning offering is received. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your faithfulness. We thank you, Father, for the way that you have been faithful to us, for the way that you have blessed us richly as a congregation. As we hear stories of the cost of living crisis on our news and as we think about the, the, the rising price of everything, perhaps, Father, it's easy to forget the way that you have blessed us. As we consider ourselves in worldly terms, we are rich beyond measure. And we thank you, Father, for the gifts that have been brought this morning. And we pray, Father, that you would take these gifts and use them for the advancement of your kingdom. Take them, Father, and build up the congregation here in Glenworry. Take them, Father, and build up the, the, the church across the globe. And as we come this morning, Father, we want to pray for our brother Tobias. Father, we thank you for the, the work that he's engaged in in Denmark. We thank you, Father, for the way that you are blessing them as a congregation. We thank you for the encouragement that they are knowing. We thank you for that wider ministry that Tobias exercises with the, the, the Gospel Coalition Nordic. And we just pray, Father, that you would continue to bless him, continue to bless his family, and continue to bless that congregation. As we come this morning, Father, we are mindful of the missionaries that we're connected with who have left everything in order to go and to follow you, who have left everything to go and to make Christ known. And as we come this morning, Father, we remember especially the little uh, church plant that's happening in Porto, Father, we thank you for them. We thank you for the fact that they were able to install new elders just a few months ago. And we pray, Father, that as these men take up posts, that you might guide them and direct them, that you might lead them uh, and help them to know how to strengthen that congregation there. We thank you, Father, for the expression of the local church. We thank you, Father, for the blessing that the local church is, for that life-on-life -life discipleship, that life-on-life -life fellowship that happens within local congregations. come this morning father we thank you for the boys and girls we thank you for the blessing that they are to us and we pray for the work of sunday school we pray for the work of faith connection we remember gb and bb as they'll start uh, as bb will start in a few weeks time father and we just pray for all of these efforts that we have to make christ known amongst our boys and girls father that you would bless them we pray father that at a young age that they might come to know jesus as their savior that they might confess their sin and come to follow Christ. Remember the needs of the local congregation here as we think of those who are sick, Father, as we think of those who are in nursing homes, as we think of those who are housebound, of those who can't get out. We pray, Father, that they might know an extra measure of your grace, that they might know your spirit going with them and before them. 
that they, Father, would be blessed as they pick up and read your word this morning, that they would be encouraged in their souls and strengthened in their walk. Remember our nation before you, Father, as we hear of more and more strikes on, on the cards. Father, we just pray for our nation as we think about the situation in Loch Ness, as we think about the political impasse that there is at Stormont, as we think of so many things, Father. It's clear that our nation needs prayer. It's clear that our nation needs you. We pray, Father, for a real work of the Spirit in our land that people wouldn't be content just to, to play at Christianity, that people wouldn't be content just to turn up at church on Sunday, but that people's hearts would be changed by the gospel, would, people's hearts would be changed by Jesus. Help us to be faithful in our sharing of you. We pray, Father, as we come uh, to your word now, Father, that you might bless us, that you might bless our, our thinking on it, that you might bless our time together. And we pray, Father, the Holy Spirit, that he would give us soft hearts, that he would give us receptive hearts to all that you have to say to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we consider that passage in John 13 together, we're going to stand and sing again this time the, the words of the hymn, Man of Sorrows. As we see Christ here, we see his full humanity in many ways, don't we? We see John 13, 21, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. He knew what it was to be troubled in spirit. He knew what it was to feel pain. He knew what it was to stand at the grave of a friend and weep. We'll sing these words as we come to study. Man of sorrows, wondrous name, for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a Savior. We stand as we praise God. Well, friends, again, if you have Bibles with you or picking one up from the seat in front of you, please turn to John chapter 13, John chapter 13 in these verses 21 to 28, so that we can see what the Lord is saying to us together through his word. 
John 13, 21 to 38. Now, I'm sure most of you already know this, but in many ways, I live quite a sad life. One of the, the Facebook groups that I belong to, and probably my favorite Facebook group, is entitled Vintage English Willow Connoisseur, which is exactly what it sounds like. People post up pictures of rare and old cricket bats that they have, and everyone admires them and tells them how lovely it looks. There are about six or eight posts a day in this group, so I'm not alone in my admiration for such things. But the group also acts as a bit of a marketplace. You know, say you have an old, rare, vintage cricket bat that you want to sell, you'll post it on this group and people will flood you with offers before you put it onto eBay or wherever. Anyway, one post one day caught my attention because it was someone on saying that they were leaving the group and I thought, how tragic. It was full of scumbags and liars and all sorts of things. If they ever met somebody from this group in real life, what they would do to them. Now, I'll be honest, it seemed a bit over the top for a group talking about vintage English cricket bats. But it transpired that this guy had arranged to go and buy a cricket bat off someone only for another member of the group to come in, offer a higher price and take it off him. He felt betrayed by the members of the group. And whenever we're betrayed, that's how we feel, isn't it? That's our natural instinct. That's what we want to do right away. We want to get even. We want to make sure that our case is heard. We want to settle the score. And yet as we come to John 13 this morning, we find Jesus being betrayed by one of his followers, betrayed by one of his friends. But rather than settling the score, rather than looking to have his own rights met, what do we find Jesus doing? He goes to Judas and he tells him, look, whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. Whatever you're going to do, do it with haste. We see Jesus being rejected by his friends and his followers. But we see him going and laying down his life willingly for those who trust him. We want to think about three things this morning, see three things from John 13. Firstly, We'll think about the truth of betrayal. As we see Judas's actions, we see how scandalous they are. Secondly, though, we'll think about a test of discipleship. How do people know that we are followers of Jesus? How will people be able to, to differentiate us from the world? And then thirdly and finally, we'll see the folly of trust in ourselves. Peter trusts in his own strength. He trusts in his own ability to follow Christ. And Jesus assures him that that is foolishness. Truth of betrayal test of discipleship and trust in ourselves so firstly then the truth of betrayal and we see that in verses 21 to 30 of john chapter 13 first half of john chapter 13 last week we thought about the humility of jesus we saw him washing his disciples feet we saw him taking that position that was lowest of the low uh, and we saw jesus instruction that we should go and do likewise how humility should mark our service as christians but as we finish, we notice that Jesus knew those who had believed in him and those who hadn't. Those who had come to living, saving faith in him and those who hadn't. Remember he said, verse 18 of John chapter 13, I am not speaking of all of you, for I know whom I have chosen. He knew the one who would betray him. He knew the one who would let him down. He knew that not all of those gathered had living, saving faith in him. And that's where we pick up then verse 21. After these things, after saying these things, after speaking to the disciples of knowing those who were not truly his, knowing the fact that his hour is behind, we're told, verse 21, that Jesus was troubled in his spirit. Now, what is it that's troubling him here? Why is he so vexed at this point? Is it his impending death? I don't think so. Many mere men have faced death with far greater uh, certainty than Jesus here. Many ordinary men face death with a steely determination. So is it that that's troubling Jesus? I don't think so. Is it the fact that he's going to be betrayed by one of his disciples? Again, I don't think so. Jesus knows what it is that's going to happen. He knows the one who would betray him. He knows that it has to be so. But rather, I think it's the sense that Jesus knows what his death will mean. So we opened our service with those words from 2 Corinthians 5. Jesus here is troubled by the fact that, that he's going to know what it is to be sin. 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's that experience of becoming the sin-bearing savior, of becoming the sin-bearing substitute. And so Christ is troubled because he knows what being the sin-bearer will mean. It's feeling the weight of being the sin-bearer that causes Christ to be troubled here, I think. And he says to the disciples, look, verse 21, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to be instrumental in having me put to death. One of you is going to hand me over to the Roman soldiers. One of you is going to betray me. You can imagine the silence in the room, can't you? You can imagine those looks to one another. It's not me. Who is it who's going to betray him? Who is it who's going to hand him over? Who is it who's going to, to collude with the religious authorities to have him put to death? One of the disciples, the one whom Jesus loves in John's gospel, the, the disciple that Jesus loved is nearly always John himself. He uses it in a way to, to refer to himself without saying his name. And he's reclining at Jesus' side. Now, we need to understand what's going on here. You know, if I invite you around to the manse, generally we're not going to recline at each other's side. You know, you'll probably get a chair, maybe even a sofa, depending. Uh, if we like you or not, maybe even the good room, if we really like you. And that's how we eat, isn't it? You know, we'll sit around a table, everyone will have their chair, but that's not what's going on here. The disciples, as they were eating with Jesus, would have reclined around quite a low table. They would have been lying on their side. And so it was quite easy for John then, being the disciple that Jesus loved, probably being closest to him, it was quite easy for John just to lean over and whisper in Jesus' ear. He was close to Jesus. He loved, this was the disciple that Jesus loved. And we see verse 24, Simon Peter motions to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. Go on, John. Find out there. We all have those looks, don't we? You know, that look that your wife gives you for the dinner table. Maybe for the boys and girls, that look that mommy or daddy gives you and you think to yourself, I'm in trouble whenever I get home here. So too, Peter gives John the look and he says to him, look, you ask him. You find out what's going on here. You ask him who it is he's talking about. And John leans over and asks Jesus, look, who is it? Who are you talking about? Which of us is going to betray you? And Jesus answers, it's the one to whom I will give this morsel of bread after I've dipped it. It only dawned on me this week that Jesus and John are so close here that he probably whispers his response to John. Because if he didn't, then everyone else would kind of know what was going on. And we see that they don't as we come to the end of this section. He whispers to John, he says to him, look, it's the one I'm going to give this morsel of bread to. It's the one who takes this out of my hand. And he hands it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And we're told, verse 27, that Satan entered him. Satan entered into him. Now, to be honest, the easy point to this, the easy thing to do at this point would be just to kind of move on and not draw attention to this. But I think that we need to figure out what's going on here and figure out what's happening in this section we've already seen so far jesus john thirteen ten, assures the disciples that not all of you are clean not every one of you is clean not every one of you has come to faith in me we've seen him uh john thirteen eighteen, talking about how he knows those whom he has chosen so Jesus already knows that Judas is going to betray him by this point. So how are we told here then, John 13, 18, that it's at, uh, John 13, sorry, uh, 27, that it's at this point that Satan enters into him? Well, think about the context. It's context that helps us to understand what's going on here. Jesus has just washed the disciples' feet. Jesus has just told the disciples that this is what greatness in the kingdom of God looks like. Jesus assures them that his kingdom is going to be one of servitude, that his kingdom is going to be one of thinking of others as better than yourself, that his kingdom, the way to greatness in his kingdom, is by being the servant of all. And so it's at this point then that Judas decides, you know what? I don't want any part of that. 
My kingdom, Judas thinks, is one of power and influence. My kingdom, the kingdom that I'm interested in, is one of driving out the hated Roman oppressors. That's my kingdom. And if Jesus isn't going to do that, then I don't want any part of it. This isn't what I signed up for, he said. This isn't the kingdom I'm interested in. This isn't the savior that I want. And so Satan uses that idolatry in his heart, that love of power, of money, and prestige, and turns him here against the savior. And you see, the truth this morning is, friends, that idolatry can lie undetected in our hearts for years. That love of anything or anyone more than God himself can lie undetected in our hearts for years. We can put on a show, we can come to church, we can do all of the right things, but there will always come a moment when it does here for Judas where we have to choose who we're going to follow. Where we have to choose between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world. And if we've allowed that idolatry to rule in our hearts for years, then just like Judas here, it'll be disastrous for us. You see, you can kid me on, you can kid the Kirk Session on, You can kid the whole of the congregation on, but you can't fool God. And you can't hide from God. If there's something or someone that you love in your heart more than God, then be sure it will find you out with devastating consequences just as it does for Judas here. And Jesus tells in verse 27, look, what you're going to do, do it quickly. Don't hang around. Get on with the job. And we can see the confusion, can't we? We see that verse 29. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. No one else apart from Jesus, Judas and John and possibly Simon Peter here know what it is that's really happening. We see the truth of betrayal. That one of those who was with Jesus, one of those who shared those moments with Jesus was the one who would betray him. But secondly then, we see the test of discipleship. And we see that in verses 31 to 35. So Judas is left. He's gone to get the garrison of soldiers. He's gone to get this detachment to betray Jesus. And Jesus then says, verse 31, look, now is the Son of Man glorified and God is glorified in him. And how is all this going to take place? How will this glorification take place? Ultimately, it's going to take place through his death. Ultimately, it's going to take place through the crucifixion. The suffering of the servant, the bringing many sons to glory, the sons, the adoption of sons and daughters of God, that's going to be how the son will be glorified. That's how the father will ultimately be glorified as right relationship is restored with those who have rejected him, with those who have turned their back on him. But ultimately, it comes through pain and suffering and a death. That's where Christ's glory is found, he says. That's where the Father will be glorified in him through death. Again, the kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom. If God is glorified in him, and he will be, God will also glorify him in himself and glory him at once. And Jesus says to the disciples, verse 33, look, I'm only with you for a little while longer. The hour is at hand. The time for my departure has come. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I say also to you, where I am going, you cannot come. You see, the path for Christ here is going to be a lonely path. The path for Christ of being our sin bearer of standing in our place will be a lonely path. Only he could tread it. None of the disciples could come on this path with him. None of the religious leaders could come on this path with him. It was his and his alone to walk. So in light of the fact that he's going away, in light of the fact that they can't come with him, verse 34, Jesus says, look, I give you this new commandment that they're to love one another. That you're to love one another just as I have loved you. 
You see, friends, it's the love of Jesus that compels us to love one another. It's the love that Christ has for us that means we are to love one another. The example that he's left behind is all the encouragement that we could need in order to love one another as brothers and sisters. Now, I know the truth this morning. Some of us are pretty hard to love. Some of us might do things that annoy each other. We might hurt each other. But the call that Christ gives us is to love one another. Despite all that, despite the difficulty, despite the hardship that it's going to be, Christ's call is to love one another. The fuel for that comes not from ourselves, but comes from Christ and his example. So we must ask ourselves this morning, are we loving one another? Loving one another, not tolerating one another, not putting up with one another. But loving one another. But maybe that's the question in your mind this morning then is why? Why should I love this person? I mean, they're particularly unlovable. Why should I care for this person? Well, Jesus himself gives us the answer in verse 35. Why does it matter? Why is it significant that we love one another? Because, verse 35, by all this, people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, if we claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, that's what we're called to do. We're called to love one another. The General Assembly of the the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, they've introduced a clever lanyard system depending on who you are and what you represent, depends on the color of lanyard that you get. You know, if you're a minister, you get a blue lanyard. If you're a, a, a ruling elder, you get a red lanyard. If you're a, someone who's invited to sit and deliberate, you get a yellow lanyard. And the idea is that it's to, to make it easy for the moderator to, to work out who's who so that it's not just ministers who are standing up and talking. That's the theory behind it anyway. You're easily identified by the color of lanyard that you have on, who you are. And so too, Jesus says to us here, look, it should be easy for us to identify who's a Christian and who's not. It should be easy for us to identify who is a true believer and who isn't. Why? Because we have love for one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples because you love one another. This is the clearest indication that you are a disciple or not if you love one another. How can we tell if someone's a disciple or not? How can we decide if someone's a true believer or not? Well, it's how they relate to their brothers and sisters. It's how they relate to the other believers within the church. Do they love the brothers and sisters? You see, we can have all our theology right. We can have all our I's dotted and T's crossed. But if it isn't showing itself in love, it doesn't really matter. You see, sometimes we draw back from this, don't we? Because we'd be much happier here, actually, if Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you can explain the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you can explain the regular principle of worship, if you can explain the difference between infralapsarianism and supralapsarianism, all men will know that you are my disciples, but he doesn't, does he? And we have to reckon with the commandment that Jesus gives us. That by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love. If you love one another. The true test of our discipleship this morning is how we relate to one another. How we care for one another. How we love one another. Thirdly, finally then, we see the folly of trust in ourselves and we see that in verses 36 to 38 peter says to jesus look where are you going i'm ready to go wherever you're going wherever it is i'm there jesus don't worry about it i have it under control where is it that you're going and jesus says look where i'm going you can't come now but you will soon You can't come straight away, but you will eventually. You see, Peter perhaps thinks that Jesus is going to Jerusalem. He thinks that this hour is the hour where he's going to wage his war. He's getting ready for his fight. And Peter doesn't want to be thought a card. So he says, look, wherever you're going, 
I'm not afraid. Wherever you're going, I can come as well. And Jesus says, look, you can't come now, but you will afterwards. And Peter, trusting in his own strength, says to him, look, Lord, why can't I follow now? If you're going to Jerusalem for a fight, I'm ready to die. If you're going to Jerusalem to wage war, I'm right there by your side. If that's what your R is all about, if that's what it means for your R to have come, I'm there. And Jesus assures in verse 38, look, you're ready to lay down your life. You're ready to die. I'm going to tell you now, before the rooster crows today, you'll have denied that you know me three times. You're going to pretend that we've never met. Rather than being there by my side, you're going to deny any knowledge of who I am. Peter puts his trust in himself. He puts his trust in his own strength, his own ability to stick with Jesus and who he was as a person. And maybe that's where we are this morning. We're trusting ourselves to make ourselves right with God. We're trusting in our good works. We're trusting in coming to church. We're trusting in giving money to the church. We're relying on our good deeds, on being a good person to make us right with God. We're trusting in our own strength. And just like Peter finds here, we'll find one day that that will never work. Because the standard that God demands is perfection. And none of us can know that. None of us can achieve that. But you see, there's another way that we can be like Peter here. Maybe we trusted in Jesus a long time ago. We confessed our sin to him and we turned to him a long time ago. But now we live as if we keep ourselves in the Christian life. It's our good works that keep us as Christians. It's the things that we do that mean that we're Christians. It's our good living that means we stay as Christians. But that's as wrong as Peter was here. The Christian life from beginning, middle, and end is a matter of grace. It's a matter of God's goodness and undeserved kindness to us. The whole of the Christian life depends not on our grip on God, on how firmly we hold on to God's hand, but depends on the fact that God holds on to us and that he who has begun a good work in us will surely carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for Christ. We thank you for his example and we thank you for his command. Help us to reckon with it this morning. Help us to love one another. Help us, if any of us has, has wrong against another, to seek forgiveness. Help us to forgive whenever that forgiveness is sought. And by this, all men will know that we are followers of Christ if we love one another. Thank you, Father, that our perseverance in the Christian life depends not on us, but on you. Depends not on our strength, but on your perfection. Help us, Heavenly Father, daily to take that grip of Christ and to know his loving arms underneath and all around us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to close and bring our time of worship to a, a, an end this morning by standing together and singing these words. Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame, a light to shine upon the road that leads me to the Lamb. We'll stand together as we sing.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, our Comforter, rest, remain, and abide with us all, both now and evermore. Amen.